Welcome everyone to another episode of Kiwi Talks. My guest today is an amazing video game writer uh, who's worked on franchises such as Half-Life, Psychonauts, Portal. He's also got many other talents. I'd like to welcome Eric Walpole. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm good. I'm curious to hear about all these other talents that I've got. Well, didn't you used to be like a database programmer before you yeah, were a writer? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't. Yeah, yes, I was. In fact, a lot of my uh, writing, game writing involves database programming as well. Uh, it's because that's a huge piece of it is just there's so much stuff to keep organized. You almost have to have somebody who gets a lot of pleasure out of keeping uh, data organized to, uh, to do this job because it can quickly overwhelm you. Uh, the, the number of lines and making sure everything's organized. So, so you're very good at time management, I would assume as a result. Time meant no. I mean, unless you mean, do I know the exact moment when I've procrastinated to the point where <laughs> I need to start now or I need to quit? I know how to do that. Uh, but yeah, no, it usually turns out being, I actually watched the, or listen to the podcast you did with Josh. And I never knew that he was talking about how much he, uh, he uh, sort of, well, he, I guess he didn't really talk about how much he procrastinates, but his time management sounded um, as bad as mine as well. So. Yeah. Well, I've heard that writers constantly procrastinate. That's kind of like the thing you do when you're a writer. Yeah, that is absolutely, I, I don't know any writer that we've ever worked with that just likes to roll up their sleeves and, and get going. There's always a lot of doing anything you can think of to put off uh, writing. In fact, I remember, this was way back in the day, working on um, Psychonauts with Tim. And a lot of times we wrote separately, but sometimes we'd sit in a room and write together. And a lot of that time was just spent uh, talking about, um, uh, what was it? Uh, the next game, which was, uh, shoot, I can't even remember the name now. The name, the game after Psychonauts with Jack Black, uh, Brutal Legend. Yeah. yeah. Like we'd waste time not, you know, just talking about, Brut I, I ended up not working on Brutal Legend, but you know, we, we would talk about it as a means to put off working on, on Psychonauts. <laughs> Right, right. So in terms of the writing process for you, what would you say is the hardest part? Is it just coming up with the initial ideas? Is it like coming up with a name for a character, the actual script of it? Like, I mean, I, all of the above? But, I, it's all kind of tough. We try not to agonize too much over names. Um, uh, you know, uh, you can get bogged down just worrying over those so maybe, maybe i I'm, I'm gonna say that's one of the easier parts is coming up with names but uh a hard part is because a lot of times uh especially what i have a jay pinkerton's my writing partner and i've yeah, just written with him for a long time and i've always tended to like to write with someone whether it was chet or tim or whoever uh i like to do it as a group so one of the harder things, just keeping the energy up, like to just keep writing, because it's really easy to kind of get into this kind of low energy, grumpy kind of mood where nothing productive is happening. So some of it's just maintaining a, an energy level to keep everybody, you know, going. Right. And is there like additional things like Red Bull or something? <laughs> no, no. Uh it's, I've heard this about other writing rooms. It usually involves you juice it by somebody will just say something horrible, like really, really bad. Not not nasty or mean to the other person, but just you're just going to make there's some jokes that aren't going to make it into the final product that just kind of they're so shocking that they just sort of juice the, the rum, so to speak. Right. Uh, Makes sense. Is it true that even though that you're a writer, you hate writing? Hate it? I mean, I, yeah. Yeah, I guess I don't like the process. When it's going well, it's fine. Or if you're together uh, and you're having good time and things are sort of rolling. Once things are rolling, 
you kind of get into this fugue state a little bit where time passes and you don't notice it passing, but the lead up to that is, is pretty painful, the starting it sort of to get that. And sometimes it never quite gets to that point, but sometimes it does. There's a, I mean, this is the, the cliche, but it's true is you'd like having written, you don't like writing, but that's true of any job. I think you like having done it, but not the actual process, the process of doing of it. it. Yeah. 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 So with, um, with any game, how far in the process do you actually start the writing? Cause I know when I spoke to Josh, he mentioned like on portal two that you didn't want to come in and start writing until later within the production cycle. Cause you don't want to write something. And then it's just made completely obsolete because of design changes. Yeah, uh, I did hear Josh said that. That isn't actually 100% of the reason because that's just a part of the game making process is every discipline ends up doing things that just get thrown out. So, but it's not always in terms of the way we do it. It's not, or the way I like to work, it's not super Product, like the game should come first and then we start applying a story to the game. So we only want to write as much as is helpful to push the game design along. And a lot of times that doesn't have, that just doesn't make sense till later on. You know, in Portal 2, since it was a sequel, we were sort of poking around at what might be interesting early on, but the actual rolling up your sleeves and, and if they're doing some tests which they always are a lot of times we'll throw some some dialogue in there or something just to kind of as sort of placeholder uh uh just to not even to see how the dialogue works but just to sort of grease the wheels to make it feel a little bit more like a real thing you know as, as someone's testing it um but it's usually pretty late or late, I, maybe late isn't the right, maybe halfway through production is right. when the really, the really intense writing starts. And then it goes all the way through to the very end, usually. So was uh, it always mapped out as like, say, Portal 2 taking years, taking place years after Portal 1? How many years is it supposed to be, by the way? I, I don't, I, I'm not even being quite, I don't know, a long time. We never really decided. It, it's a long time. You didn't have a concrete... No just it's a it's a it's a long time yeah, after yeah. uh that's the other thing try not to write yourself into a corner that you then are gonna it's gonna cause problems for you because we we weren't sure if it was maybe someday there's another portal or something happens and if we say it's if it doesn't help us to say it's a hundred years in the future or 10 years in the future or a thousand years in the future if there isn't a problem that that actually solves then why even say it because mm. we may want it we, we may have an idea later on for the next game. Not that there ever will be. I don't know if there ever will be a next game, but where you want there to we, be a next game though, don't you? Oh yeah. I would love to. Yeah, yeah. I'd work on another portal in a second, but I, yeah, I can't do it unfortunately by myself. So, I mean, I like working with, I mean, I can't like make it happen by myself. Well, you must have a bit of leverage at valve. Don't you? You can, you can advocate for it. Oh, I could advocate for it. I would not going to, do it. I can help, but I could do it. Uh, uh, it might help a little bit, but uh, the problem is with 300 employees and there isn't, you know, I, I don't know exactly the breakdown, like how many of them are on the production side versus steam business side versus legal ver versus whatever. Yeah, of course. Yeah. There, there's only so there's a lot of opportunity cost to uh, taking you know, 75 people and trying to get a game made. Like there's, you know, as much as it seems like Valve often isn't, there's just a bunch of people sitting around, you know, sipping gin and tonics by a pool that everybody's working. They're working all the time. It's just, you don't always see the, it doesn't always end up coming out or it comes out years later. Or it gets turned into something else. So uh, there's, everybody is accounted for, I guess is what I'm saying. People are all doing something. So you almost have to take them. You'd have to, it's like a revolution. You'd have to, you'd have to stir up a bunch of people to leave what they're currently working on and come work on something else. In this case, it would be portal three. Yeah. I mean, it would be a money maker. Come on. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. You're going to, Hey, you're preaching to the choir here. You'd make some money. Uh, the problem is, 
you would make money, but is it, what kind of money will you make? You know, uh, are you going to make Counter-Strike Go money? Probably not. Uh, but having said that, maybe every game doesn't need to make Counter-Strike Go money. You know, Gabe, if you're listening. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe. Well, yeah, I mean, cause maybe it's enough. Well, there's a bit of a misperception, I think, sometimes. Where people just think everyone at Valve is not doing anything because, you know, games don't come out at a, a rapid rate, which is obviously not true. I mean, obviously, you guys are doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes from Steam Deck and managing Steam in and of itself, and then there's other stuff on top of that, I'm sure. Yeah, and there's games or... Or stuff that gets cancelled. There's yeah. prototypes. Cancelled is even too top-down, too... too authoritarian a word i guess it sometimes it stuff just falls apart like it becomes clear to people that this just isn't working out uh or like i was just describing something's kind of going along and maybe it's not going it's not turning into the thing that everybody had hoped it would turn into but it's still a group of people and you're all sort of working on it together and you don't always want to admit that. And then slowly people peel off to go work on something else that's been proposed. It makes it sound uh, insane. And it, it makes more sense when you're there. It, it's not as, as chaotic as, as uh, I'm probably making it sound. Well, no, it can't <clears> be. If, if, because obviously every product that's been released by Valve is, is great, you know. Yeah, there's, they're usually there's nothing, a, there's they're nothing hit, they're bad that's been released. Bar. Yeah, there's, there's uh, a I'm high quality say, bar. Yeah, yeah, there's a high quality bar. And part of that is because by the time something reaches like full production mode, there is a lot of buy-in from people. And there are people working on it because they want to work on it. Right. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of enthusiasm usually in, in that middle part. And then there's just despair. And by the end, <laughs> you're just... You're, everybody's sad and ready to be done. Because uh, isn't, isn't that what happened with Portal 2? There was like this big team and then it kind of kept getting smaller and smaller, smaller until yeah. it dwindled down into like a, quite a small team. Yeah, it was on the verge of falling apart the way various Valve projects fall apart. And it did. It, a bunch of people left to go work on uh, other things things at some point left for dead two took a lot of people but it, the exodus had already sort of started before then um and there was just a little core group left uh josh and uh josh i think he mentioned this on the podcast they, they almost even though they were technically still working on portal two they actually jumped ship Garrett and Josh and I think John Guthrie and maybe somebody else to make a it's like Portal One for the Xbox or something. And yeah, I think I remember a, Josh mentioned that. Yeah. Um, but then, and then things started to uh, get some. If I I don't even know if I have the chronology right in my head, but then things started to pick up again. A lot of it had to do with going back to portals. Uh, there originally it was a different mechanic, it was stop and, or something. Yeah, 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 it was f stop, and then it went back to portal, uh, and it started to get traction, and people started coming back. And then we sort of all stopped, except for maybe a handful to ship Left for Dead Two. I don't remember how many months that took. A bunch of people jumped on at the end of Left for Dead Two. Um, that was kind of a, an almost all hands on deck sort of situation. Uh, but at that point, there was enough buy-in on Portal 2 that it wasn't really in danger of just falling apart. It was pretty clear, like Left 4 Dead 2 was going to ship. It wasn't mm. some long tail game that everybody was going to have to, you know, some skeleton crew was going to have to work on for the rest of their lives. Everybody would come back who was originally working. And then that same thing happens with Portal 2 is that it's getting close you know, as it got closer and closer to shipping, more and more people would jump on uh, to help get it out the door. Um, you know, and by the end, it was a big production. I think there was all the uh, the production side was working on Portal 2 with a sub. There was still a crew working on Dodo was being worked on at the time. 
Right. I, it's possible when Portal 2 shipped, Dota was actually out like in beta or something, but maybe not. I, I can't remember now. Um, but anyway, and then Portal 2 ships and then everybody moves on. I don't know what they moved on to after that, but uh, I yeah. can't remember what I moved on to. Oh, we did a couple of DLCs, but that was with smaller groups. Maybe that's what we were working on after that. Anyway, yeah. It, mm. it, Portal 2 came pretty close to just being, if not killed, you know, maybe it would have been come back again in in some form later on, but it would have been that team would have just disbanded and somebody might take another run at it years later or whatever. That's crazy to me because it's so acclaimed. And in my opinion, I think it's Valve's best game still to this day. Oh, well, I'm happy that you think that. Thank you. The um, <laughs> uh, Because I did it all myself. Um, the uh, I think... Uh, you may not have felt that way about the earlier version that people were abandoning, right? It that was a different thing. Well, that's so, that's game development though, trial and testing. Yeah, it's the games are bad until until they're. Uh, yeah, I remember reading an interview with Cliffy B. Cliff Blazinski at one point. I, I'm paraphrasing now, where he was talking about people say, "Oh, all you do is get to play games all day," but he was like no, what I get to do is go in and play a really terrible game and it's up to me to try and figure out how to make it good, which is a, you know, it's a daunting um, problem to solve. Totally. Um, I know with the initial idea with Portal 2, you were struggling a bit until uh, you came up with the idea of Wheatley and that kind of caused a compounding effect of ideas to pop up, didn't it? In terms of um, making the story aspects of it work. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Wheatley was in there early on, but I think what unlocked stuff was we had a longer game than Portal 2, and we were we didn't really want GLaDOS to be the antagonist the whole time, uh, A, because that was just sort of going to... Actually, I was going to say that would track Portal 1, but it would actually be more reductive and uh, even than Portal 1, because in Portal 1, she was sort of neutral for a while and then became... Uh, an antagonist but uh what the thing that unlocked everything was when we came up with the idea that wheatley was the core that was designed to be stupid and kind of dampen gladys's intelligence and that he would take over the facility um and then give you and glados something to kind of uh butt up against uh and again that that's one of those things where we were sort of struggling and like Wheatley was going to died. Uh, like he sort of seems like he dies, gets killed by GLaDOS in portal two. But at one point he was just dead. And then I can't remember what we were going to do at that point. But, um, but the idea of him coming back and the intelligence dampening core, like that all came in one session where we were sitting around talking about it. And it is that thing where sometimes you have an idea that I'm not going to say is so good because I mean that I pat myself on the back, but it's so perfect for the problem you're trying to solve or fits right. so well that suddenly just idea after idea starts coming out. And so like a lot of the back half of the game broad strokes wise came out of, you know, one, two or three hour session in the middle of this three year project or whatever. Ah, that's fascinating stuff. In terms of the dialogue, like how long does it take you to fine tune? I mean, because, or I mean, I imagine with uh, Wheatley, for example, Stephen Merchant must have ad libbed a lot of stuff. Um, sort of, yeah. He, uh, you know, we obviously let uh, Stephen Merchant ad lib what he wanted. We also spent a lot of time listening to. I mean, we cast him. It wasn't like some cold cast where he was just like Steve Merchant and he, uh, you know, uh, we didn't know who he was. Uh, we, we spent a lot of time listening to his podcast and stuff like that. And we try and write oh. to his voice. And so a lot of that was written. His delivery and the stop and start uh, kind of just like the flow of his uh, speech patterns was him and he would improvise in the studio but a lot of times while it was really funny he would throw in a lot of like pop culture references and stuff that we didn't um we couldn't use because it just wasn't 
what we were looking for there. But it, again, much like with the writing in the studio, you want to keep the energy up as well. So him just going off and riffing on something, even if it was unusable, was was usually good just to keep everybody, you know, uh, for, it doesn't sound like a lot, but these four four hours is kind of the maximum union wise recording session. But it's also four hours is a huge amount of time to be in there uh, recording dialogue. It's just totally. it's just it's really uh, you wouldn't think it would be draining and tiring uh, to do you know kind of sit in a room and and uh, both act or, or direct for four hours, but it's it's rough. Uh, uh, I can't remember what I said. So yeah, there was some improv, but we all Wheatley's lines were written out. I mean, also not just because we're control freaks, but because it's kind of bad form to just go in with an actor and be like, "Hey, can you just make some stuff up for it?" Like they got enough work to do. Like you need to provide them with with the material uh, that they need uh, to do this. And I think you know, with Stephen Merchant, I don't remember now. I bet it was. You know, over the course of three years and, you know, he's front and center in the game. But in terms of development, maybe we had five sessions with him of four hours each, you know, over the course of the whole thing. So you have to be, even though I'm saying he's improvising and going off off script a little bit, you only get so many shots at it. Like you got to have your you got to pick your battles and have your stuff set up pretty well before you go in because you tend to not get a lot of opportunities um to mess around with stuff and it's not like putting on a play where you're gonna have a lot of rehearsals and things which is another thing is we try and as often as possible like with steven merchant or with uh nate bargetzi in uh death's job uh we we try and write to people's a voice that's kind of natural to them. You know, we're not going to, uh, unless it's, they're really, no, we, we typically try to, you know, write to something that we know they're going to be able to do, but you always find things that they do better or worse. So, you know, the, the fourth session is usually, or the, even the second session is usually a lot more productive than the first session where you're kind of making notes and figuring out what, even though you think you have a good idea what the actor can and can't do, uh or what they're better or worse at uh you tend to you know be it becomes a lot clearer after the first session uh, so we always like to oh go ahead no 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 was, you keep going keep going i can oh, the only thing I was, and, and just to, we, we always try and do you know like for steam merchant who was in um uh lives in london and based in london uh so even pre COVID, obviously, we, we did those sessions remotely, except for the first one. We always try and do the first session in person with an actor, just so everybody can see each other. And, you know, you're all real people to each mm. other. And uh, it's just it, it's a good for relationship building for then the future session. Everybody kind of knows everybody a little bit. Yeah, it makes sense. Makes sense. So in terms of, I mean, directing in general because is it just you directing or how many of you are actually directing him at the it same depends time? on who's you know in the uh for the so typically it's it's always me and jay pinkerton um yeah and uh for portal we had uh bill van buren who uh was um he worked at valve and did a lot of sound stuff and he was just good at being in the um in the room a nice calm voice uh but you know for some older tf stuff it was would be me and chet uh but usually somebody takes the lead and often nowadays it's just jay because he's better at it and i pace around behind him and then we talk about it uh you know if we have any notes or anything um but you we always try and give you know there's one person who's kind of the quote-unquote director just so there isn't seven well, there, there's never seven people in there, but so there just are two people just shouting random things. Uh, so, um, yeah, so it's, you know, occasional or, and, but then Jay used to smoke. So there would be a little change in the guard because he can only go about 45 minutes without getting a cigarette. So he'd have to go outside and get a cigarette and then I'd take over for a little bit. Right. Uh, but, um, yeah. Uh, makes sense. 
Makes sense. Yeah. So was it the same with Half-Life Alex? Like, did you advocate for Reese Darby to play Russell, for example? Was he, I, the person, yes. was he the person you were thinking of when you were writing it? Well, I Reese Darby didn't actually enter into my... So my very first thought was I really wanted Nate Bargetsy, who we eventually used in Desk Job, to be uh, Russell. Uh, it wasn't like I was debating between Reese Darby and Nate Bargetsy. That was who I had in my head in the very beginning, but it turned out there was some stuff happening that we couldn't... Nate couldn't do it. And then we were like, "Uh uh-oh, what are we going to do? And then we were thinking about it, and uh, we we all, like, that was uh, me and Jay and uh, Sean Vanneman was also, uh, the three of us were writing Alex. And so, Reese, it's not like he was our second choice. He was just an orthogonal choice once Nate Bargetsy couldn't do it. It, We weren't weighing the two of them. Uh, And so we, we got in touch with his people, and he was like, sure. Uh, happy to do it and it all worked out it did work out he was <laughs> yeah. uh he was great he was a nice guy he was based in los angeles i thought we were going to have to go to new zealand uh which i've always wanted to do but uh he j- maybe he is based in new zealand now i may for, actually I think probably he, not he's he to... alternates so i okay. think he he's mainly based in la but then he comes back to new zealand i think every now and then because obviously he does a lot of hollywood films so that's yeah probably why he's based in la I don't know where that new show he's in is filmed, uh, but uh, it, it was crazy because we, Jay and I were in, I, when we go to Los Angeles, we, we were, did all his recordings in person in Los Angeles. Maybe one we did remote, but um, uh, I never know where we are. We're in, like, we, we're, are we in Burbank or I, I don't, I never have a clear picture of where we are, but anyway, we were near the hotel just wandering around killing time before the session and uh, just walking down the street. I don't know, just some random area. And there, here comes Reese Darby just walking up towards us. Uh, we just met him on the street with his wife uh, and he uh, had no idea. Didn't remember us from the first session. So that uh, didn't know who we were. Uh, seemed real nervous when we were like, we're just, we're, we're going to see you in an hour. Uh, but he was, um, yeah, he was great. Yeah. So how was the writing process for Half-Life, Alex? Because from what it sounds like, that went through quite a substantial change. Yeah. From, we, from the um, initial stages to the end product. Yeah, that was, a, that was different than any of the stuff. You know, different and similar. Uh, different in the fact that there was a... Jay and I had left Valve um, a, right around the time Alex was first starting uh when it was uh, not much was uh, it was it was in a real small formative state and as it started going along they brought in they hired a writer uh at valve and he was working on story and they had a whole game based around this story uh i mean it wasn't finished but it was finished enough that you could play it and um they started play testing it with the whole company and the feedback was is pretty, is, you know, all this is great, but the, it doesn't seem like the story is working. Like that was a common thread. And so I don't remember the exact sequence of events, but there was a whole thing where they're like, well, we're either going to have to scrap this and we can't, we're not going to restart. So we've got all this track uh, that kind of tells a story but the story that's there isn't working. So, you know, they asked, well, Sean was already there. He was, and Jay was back full time. He, he only left when he left, it was almost like a sabbatical more than, than quitting or something. But, um, uh, and so they were like, we're going to, can you write us? Can you pitch us a story? that this was Deshaun and Jay, and then they got me involved. Um, Cause I had, I was already a little bit back at that point. Cause Jay and I, I had come back as a contractor to work on the Aperture Hand Lab with Jay and then uh, Cloudhead Games, which was a, a contractor. Anyway, uh, they were like, can you pitch us a story that will more or less fit with what we have here? And then, uh, yeah, can you do that? So I came, 
out to valve and we sat in a room for a couple of weeks uh, and tried to figure out something that would make sense. You know, it didn't have to be exact. Like we were going to have some ability to make some new cuts, you know, have cut scenes and uh, not cut scenes, you know, the Alex thing where there's sort of a, a choreo scene. Um, you know, so there, there was a budget and by budget, it's not, I don't mean monetary budget. It's more just like people's time. And so that this will ship, you know, this century. Uh, and uh, so we did it. We, we sat in a room, we came up with something, took us about two weeks. And then right before I left, we got up in front of the team, which was big at that point. It was like, I want to say it was like 80, 80 people or at least 80 people there. And we pitched almost fully the story that ended up in the game we made some i mean not like line by line but the major beats of everything right and they were like let's do it uh and so then i can't remember exactly i feel like there was a year it was maybe a year after that pitch meeting i could actually look it up because since i'm a contractor i have to account for my hours so the nice thing is i have almost like a little diary of it what i did every day um, but I want to say it was a year or a year and a half that we spent after that, uh, just getting it, getting it all done. But did it stay this, like from its initial stages when, when you guys came on, was all of the original story trashed or were there little threads that still stayed? Like was, that the, definitely ending, was the ending what, always the, the way it was? It was or, not exactly the way it was, but it was, it was in broad stroke. Yeah. So the broad stroke story was the G man is captured and you go and you let him out. That was, and that's the part that we kept, but there were other characters and there was some other stuff happening. Um, but the broadest stroke of we are going to start in city 17 uh, you and, you know, and that Alex would be, uh, that was one of the immovable objects is Alex is the main character uh, or the viewpoint character. Mm. And it's going to end in a vault where you will let the G-man go. But that was kind of the, 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 one of the biggest problems was what would happen once you let him out. That, that was a piece that people were dissatisfied with in, in the form that it was in. And I don't even remember what, what it was at that point. But, and the problem was you've got, you, you kind of let Satan or God or whatever you want to call him out of prison. Like you do a big favor for, for uh, Satan and what does he give you in return? It should probably be something monumental. Uh, and so, you know, the, the ending is it that that is that ending w was what we pitched. Um, and, you know, that was the part you were building towards this and and in the pitch. And we're like, oh, boy, you know, because it could be when you first hear it, you're like, uh oh, uh, this. But then, yeah, it, it turned out fine. Uh, some of it was just. It was kind of we had to if they hated it from top to bottom, this was literally our, the best pitch we had, you know, we weren't, we didn't have a plan B. So uh, it might've entailed if everybody had really hated it, it probably would have maybe killed the product. I, I don't know exactly what would have happened. Luckily it, it, uh, it, it went through. And then, you know, then there was a bunch of work after that. So yeah. there was, yeah, one day of, uh, of, of thrilling excitement and then uh, a year and a half of, of grinding it out. Yeah. But I'm, I'm sure Valve is aware, uh, obviously, of like the Half-Life 3, you know, propaganda and everything. I mean, Gabe must be over being asked that question every time he does an interview. But like, were, <sighs> you, were you trying to like lay little threads or connect the dots to Half-Life 2? Was that always the, the intention? I don't know if that was always the intention. Uh, you know, it came from because we were struggling with the ending as well. I can't remember if, I, if I've mentioned this or not, but you know that that was a big problem. Like we cracked a, it, to our mind a lot of the TikTok of getting to the vault, and then we were like, "Well, 
we're still left with this unsatisfying, you know, what happens at the end. And uh, uh, one of the artists, Jim Murray, I was coming, just riding up in an elevator with him. And uh, I'm like, I just laid out the problem briefly because it was elevator ride. And he's like, you know, what if, uh, I can't remember exactly how he phrased it, but what if the G-Man saves um, Eli? I was like, oh, that's idiotic. But then I started thinking about it and I was like, Man, that, that's actually not bad. It's like, uh, and then I went and again, uh, it was just because I was in the luck of the draw to have Jim Murray randomly spouting out an idea that I liked. Uh, and then I pitched it that morning to, uh, I think, uh, oh, it was Jay and Jay and Sean. And, you know, they, it's everybody who heard it initially resisted it for about 30 seconds until they let it kind of sink in. Uh, and then it just seemed like once again, it, it solved a lot of problems and it was a big, you know, it was actually something worthwhile. Like you, you got, you got a set. Oh, there's a giant bug on my diet. Oh, look at that. Woo Stay oh. bug. Uh, nope, now it's gone. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I don't even know what the question was anymore, but that, oh, it was, that's just, it was more, more like tying, tying it back to half-life too, I suppose. Yeah, I, it wasn't, no, it wasn't uh, always going to be tied back to Half-Life 2. In fact, that was the biggest ask uh, in terms of new content was this ending because none of that was there before. Now we're like, well, can you make a, a version of the Half-Life 2 ending scene? You got to bring Dog back. And I think Jim Murray ended up having to do that work. That was his punishment for coming up with the idea <laughs> is he had to remodel Dog. Uh but that was a that was that did not exist other than conceptually, you know, or more than conceptually, concretely, that scene existed in Half Life Two, uh, but did not, you know, we did none of it was in Alex, uh, so some people had to remake that whole thing. So yeah, that was a big ask, wow. just in terms of content and time. Was well, this crazy that the genesis of it is an elevator ride? Yeah, you never know. Uh, that's good. I. That's one thing that you don't get with, with COVID and Zoom is just so many good things come out of people just being together and talking about things. Yeah, uh, yeah, which is something you miss. Uh, you miss with the Zoom stuff. So, what's your relationship like with Gabe? Like, would he ever sit in with like the writers at any point, or would, did he just let you do your thing? Because I know when I spoke to Josh, he mentioned that some of the designers are like, oh my gosh. Like, Yes, take down notes or everything he says. Yeah, I think uh, he, Gabe's like involvement with the day to day production predates by some amount me even showing. Now, I showed up a couple, Chet and I showed up together like the week that Half Life 2 shipped. So it would have been yeah. like November 2004. And Gabe was already not involved in the day to day production. So, I mean, he's interested and I, I'm friendly with, I'm not, uh, I mean, everybody's a little bit scared of Gabe, but I'm not like, I'm <laughs> happy to have a conversation, you know, I talk to him. Uh, I, I feel like I can send him mail email without it being weird or, you know, something like that. But, um, I like talking to him. Uh, but no, he was not involved in the writing and we didn't, uh, uh like solicit his opinion on things uh, right you know he's he's doing he's got a lot of stuff Gabe things yeah. yeah he's he's uh yeah he's doing all his things uh which don't involve uh sitting in with me and jay and listening to us be idiots so yeah he's got way more important things to do yeah so with the writing are you what writing on a laptop are you writing with with a pen, like, and you just got this massive stack of paper, paper that, oh, <laughs> no. uh, a whiteboard, like what, what do you use? Sometimes we're, we will sketch things out on a whiteboard, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm 
usually writing, if I'm writing by myself, which I'm not a huge fan of, then I'm just writing on Google Docs or Word or something. Uh, right. um, okay. But I'll, if I'm in the room, it's usually, I mean, the way we typically work is uh, uh, Jay is typing. I make it sound like Jay is, <laughs> Jay's t- Jay does everything <laughs> while, I, while I stand back, uh, yeah. which is sort of true. Um, but so we're, we're talking and talking and Jay's writing, although sometimes we both have an idea and we're, we're, it's not like competing ideas. It's like Jay's having an idea. I'm having an idea and he's like, just write it, just write it down. And so then I'm in, which is one nice thing about Google docs is, um, you're both sort of, yeah, you know, everybody's in there together writing. Uh, yeah. So, but yeah, it's, it's something it's on a computer. I'm, I'm not writing anything by hand. Hmm. So out of all the characters that you've written, do you have like a particular favorite or one that was the easiest to write for? Oof. I'm trying to think. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe, I, maybe you know, not. I guess they're all hard. <laughs> well, they're, they're all hard to a certain extent. I would like it if they were. Yeah, I guess the one that weirdly is closest that where it just flows more naturally to my particular uh, taste would be like the kind of institutional voice in Portal Two, the 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 male voice that just talks. Oh, uh, the, oh yeah, I know the yeah, I know the voice. I, yeah. Not even saying that's my favorite character at the end of the day, but that is probably the thing that is easiest was always easiest to write um and but in terms of writing like the stuff that you know like tf2 blog posts and things like that flow pretty naturally because that's just my prose writing style so that that stuff is is fun to write and isn't you agonize over it a little bit but it's not yeah it's just very natural to write also, the prose writing, you don't have, there's no layer of abstraction between you and the final product like there is with when someone's going to act it, you need to make sure. There's a lot of times when you write something, even now, years and years later, we get in the studio and we're like, what were, you know, no human can, can say these, this is idiotic. Uh, this is just terrible. Mo- most of these sessions are us, you know, 50% of it is us apologizing to the actor for uh, making them say these words and then we'll quickly rewrite it. Uh, it's just, it's a crazy blind spot. I think everybody has it is you just, you write stuff and it seems decent enough on the page and it's just very clear once somebody says it out loud, which is weird too. Cause typically we're Jay and I are just talking the whole time. I mean, we're saying the lines, you know yeah that's what i was gonna ask i was like yeah yeah we're all lines to test it yeah yeah i you you would think i don't know i can't explain it so but but then sometimes but sometimes it's it's the person who says it right or an accent like a certain accent can maybe make something or a piece of dialogue sound way cooler or better than it would if if a certain other accent is used there's just also words that actors have just never said or don't say well like nate bargetsy crushed it loved him loved working with him but turret was just a word he had never said which is unfortunate because <laughs> turret is something that's a central component of aperture desk job so we just kind of had to work through that um and some of uh, stuff we do with portal has a convoluted style that has some where we will have to work a line a little bit more because we want you to say these ridiculous words, you know, semi-technical stuff, but we want you to say it with some authority. Like you, you're not, you know, this isn't the first time you've ever, these words have ever, uh, you know, left your mouth or entered your head. So uh, in those cases, that, that is an acting problem that we will solve as opposed to just rewriting rewriting it right that makes perfect sense though but it's a it's, it's, i suppose it's a good good challenge to have i mean do you do you do you get to a point now where if you're playing a game or even if you're watching a film actually where you're 
kind of f- zoning in or honing in on the on the writing? I mean, I guess everybody is. I, I mean, not not so so. I mean, I I have taste just like anybody. If I'm watching something and I don't like it, you know, I I I just don't like it. But I, I guess more of a thing would be. I think about how much work it took to do something like I, I specifically remember playing God of War and really enjoying it. But while, you know, during the week that I spent playing God of War, I was having these stress dreams because it was thinking about the pain it must have taken to make that game because it's all so huge and polished and uh, it must have just been um, so happy i i had nothing to do with that game uh but also you know i enjoyed playing it uh so i guess that's more the thing as i just look at stuff and think about how much work it must have been to do it Mm. so how do you stay uh stress-free i don't i'm stressed all the time (laughs) i mean i'm not super stressed now because i'm not working Yeah, Uh, yeah but um even during desk job, which was fairly low stakes, low stress, I was telling Josh, I, uh, you know, Josh and I have a Zoom call maybe once a week or something. And I'm like, I'm right back in it. Like I'm having stress dreams and it's stressful. Uh, but that's, I mean, that's just, I, you know, before when I was doing database work, that was stressful too. I, anybody, if you have some amount of pride or you care about what you're doing you know it's going to be stressful to do it i think but yeah i suppose particularly in the case where you've got millions of people that are going to see your work or witness yeah i guess there's there's that too there there is that although that that's i i I wonder sometimes though because i i because i was almost as stressed out doing the database stuff which only you know the client and then, you know, the people you work with would see. And that was the more stressful part for me always was letting down those. Because the millions of people out there are sort of, it's a weird abstraction. You know, it's just kind of like, mm, hey, you, you do what you do. I mean, I, I want it to be well received, but you're more like trying to not let down the people that you're working with. Uh, you want to do a good job. Yeah, which is fair enough. So in terms of your writing, if you had to critique your own writing, would you like, what would be the thing you'd like to improve most on? I mean, I'd like it to be just better in general. Uh, but, you know, we, we rely on, we have crutches and ticks that we use all the time. Uh, you know, we've got these comedic obsessions. I was just talking to Jay about it a couple of months ago because they come up in desk job our our big comedic obsessions are getting fired owing a lot of money to dangerous people and going to prison those three things crop up all the time uh i I guess i'm not i don't know if i would change it because i still enjoy thinking about it and writing stuff about it but you know and there's character traits that if you look at it you know, the actor could change things and you try and make them different, but, you know, we'll write Cave Johnson lines and I'll be like, that's just Saxon Hale. Like those two are very similar. So, you know, you're like, be nice if those two characters were wildly different, but you know, your brain is only as good as your brain is and and mine's, you know, okay, but not, you know, uh, it's, it's not the best. I don't have the best brain. So, uh, you know, we end up reusing things a lot. Um, you know, and anything that comes out of your own head is typically not startlingly new to you, right? Like it's kind of, although if you go back and revisit something you did 15 or 20 years ago, it suddenly seems like something somebody else did. And you're like, wow, I wish I was that good still because uh, this stuff is awesome. Uh, mm. So I don't have know. You- have you ever recorded uh, or had an actor record a piece of dialogue and then the designers are like, no, we're not including that. And you're like, God damn it. This is like so good. Such a good line. Oh, yeah. Uh, although we will typically try and rework it. If it's like a gag that's a, even slightly uh, reusable somewhere else, we'll usually try and repurpose it, at least writing wise and re-record it. But yeah, tons of stuff gets thrown out. 
Um, but I guess that would be another thing I would like to write with the, have the same effect, but with the half as many words uh, that, but it's just hard. It's harder. Uh, well, writing's just a hard art form anyway. Yeah. I mean, it's all, I, I look at what everybody, it's all hard. I look at what the artists do and I genuinely, like, I think they look at what we do and they're like, well, I write, I can kind of do that. But I look at <laughs> what they do, like Jim Murray or any of the valve artists. Uh, and I'm like, I don't even know where you would start to, to do this stuff. How does it go from your head to the paper, the Wacom tablet or whatever? I, I no clue it's a complete like magic trick to me so but when you're writing are you seeing like a visual in your head you must be like picturing some sort of image yeah sometimes uh that's a that's a weird uh, not a weird question it's a good question i never really thought about before uh yeah i don't know uh like could you sometimes... write something and then maybe pitch it to the artists i'm like have sometimes, you ever done that? Yeah, sometimes we will. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll think that it would be good if this scene was sort of surrounded by something. Like, I think, I, I want to say that, but I don't know that this is actually the case, but let's just pretend it is for the moment. I think like at the end of Aperture Desk Job, you go up into Cave's office and he's just a big cement head. And I think think that's something Jay and I came up with and then we pitched to the artists. Um, so there was something that was, you know, gags that are sort of visual along with, you know, just, just the words. Uh, but if that wasn't the case there, if one of the artists came up with the head thing, there's, there are other cases like that. That's an example of something that, that where we might come up with the visuals. Um, and we, and again, this is Jay more than me. We do these, Team Fortress comics and Jay's a much I, I'm not a comic guy at all uh, but Jay's a huge comic fan and so he very like we'll write it together and then he panels them out using just like clip art and stuff and he will panel it out in a general way for the artist to be like here's kind of what I'm thinking for this panel and this panel and this panel so there's a much more direct connection to the stuff we do with comics uh in terms of uh describing visually what what's going to happen ah that's cool that's cool that yeah, you're able to convey it, it. like because well, you know yeah. how some people they're not able to necessarily convey in their yeah. head jay's what they, a good what uh, they want, yeah want he's a do. good he's not an artist but he's a good designer like he's actually really good like he knows Photoshop better than a lot of the artists do. He's good at just general, I don't know what you call it, just design, but he's also really good at paneling out the, um, the comics. He know, just knows a lot about comics. I've learned a lot about how comics work because I literally knew nothing about how comics work uh, before we started doing comics. Yeah. So what was your involvement with the Steam Deck then? What did you do? Was it like just programming stuff? Oh, the Steam Deck? With? Yeah. No, no, we we just I mean Aperture, Aperture Desk Job was part of the Steam Deck. Oh, launch. right. So that okay, was all okay. we did. Yeah. Okay. That, I had nothing to do with any any of the rest of it. Right. Uh, okay. The, all the all the, the rest of that stress was on everyone else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh that's why, you know, Desk Job was free. It came w with the Steam Deck like it, that's why there should have been no stress, but you want it to be great. Like you want to be like this needs to be awesome. So let's let's try and make it really awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, which involves you know a lot of work, a lot of thinking about it. Hmm. Now, is it true that you want a Sunset Overdrive too? <laughs> I do. I like Sunset. Yeah, I love Sunset Overdrive. Uh, sure. I I don't think I'm ever going to get it, but I would like it. Oh, uh, you know, people at Microsoft, don't you? <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't. I know people who know people at Microsoft. I'm, I'm one degree of separation uh, away from them, but I, yeah, I don't know anybody at Microsoft. The gaming industry is actually quite small, though, in terms of the people that actually work within it. I would think. I, yeah, it's like it feels it's, like it's, I've met a lot of people. It's still small. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's or, all or interconnected. It's small in the sense that if I haven't met everybody, which I haven't, um, I. Uh, 
I could probably find I know a way to somebody who knows them. Like you yeah, could yeah. probably you're a couple days away from getting in contact with almost anybody. I mean, there's probably people in maybe the Japanese end of the business that it would be harder to get in contact with. But um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's small in that sense. Uh, and I think, you know, you never, there always seems to be, a job. once you're established to a certain amount, I don't know what it would take for you to be like drummed out of the industry entirely. So, because, you know, they always need people. Uh, so it's small in, in that sense. Have you, have you taken on like more of a contractor role and not a permanent s- staff member? primarily to just kind of take a step back so you can kind um, of that was the original stress. thing we just needed uh because my wife needed to, her uh needs needed to uh take care of her mom and so we needed to move back to cleveland and it was kind of the right time but there's also just some legal stuff with valve where to be a full-time employee it's just a you need to live in washington state in washington yeah uh, uh that might change that, though, won't it? Hmm? Oh, it, that it might it change might, i i don't know what i don't know the whole reasoning behind it uh but i also do i it's nice to just be able to kind of drop in when there's something that's interesting uh and then not uh be there if i don't have to be there or feel like i need to do something, you know, fill my day if there's nothing going on that I really want to work on. Yeah. Um, well, you are yeah. a trooper. Um, I mean, Josh mentioned to me that like you were, you had a child while, while Portal 2 was shipping. Like you're in the middle yeah. of like a child. Uh, birth. We had Talk about our stressful. Son, <laughs> yeah. Our son was born almost a year to the day before portal two ships so that last year was uh oh my god i, I do remember that I remember, I remember one thing i was giving josh some crap about it uh he kind of made it sound like i was just storming around the house in my wife beater with a cigarette dangling <laughs> out of my mouth telling my wife that this is how things are going to be it was a discussion we were like because i was at the time i was like look we can and this isn't a passive aggression like we need to make a decision here like either if I'm going to finish Portal 2, I think it'll be good for us, ultimately. Uh, but I'm going to, you, you know, she knows me. Uh, we've been together for 30 years or whatever. Uh, I'm going to have to commit to this fully because it's a ton of work. And, uh, you know, she was she quit her job when, you know, the last couple of months of her pregnancy. And thanks to Valve, she didn't have to work anymore if she didn't want to. But I was like we can pack it up right now. And this would actually be fine. It'd be a relief. Uh, I like finishing things, but another great pleasure of mine is walking away from things when in the middle of <laughs> things being really difficult. Uh, I was like, we can go back to Minnesota. You can get a nursing job there. You know, we've saved up because I always think that we're going to, I'm going to get fired any second. So we were pretty frugal. We had a bunch of money saved. We could live for the first year or two of Jack's life. And then I'm going to be unemployable because I have no real marketable skills outside this weird little niche, but you're, she's a nurse. I'll stay home with Jack and you can, you know, you can work, but yeah, we, she, no, it was, uh, she, we, we made the decision that that first year, and it was, it turns out to be a good move that first year. I don't know if you have any kids, but it's a blur. You won't remember it anyway. Um, Not yet, but I will soon yeah. enough so uh, yeah. you will not remember that first year uh and then once portal 2 shipped it was never that intense again uh, okay. so uh and it afforded us the ability to you know she could stay home she didn't want to have a job she didn't have to have a job so uh yeah it's all good she does not it was a mutual decision mutually okay. agreed upon so yeah mutually agreed even though it was hard. Okay. Good, good it clarification. Was yeah. It was hard. Although the divisional labor, I mean, it was hard, but it was hard for, you know, I wasn't off at the strip clubs every night. I was working hard. She was working hard. We were both working hard. Uh, so she at least didn't feel like I was slacking off. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I didn't feel like she was slacking off and Jack was a good baby. So that it was fairly, it worked, fairly yeah. simple. It worked out fine. Yeah. Yeah. 
Mm. Well, uh, hey, I'll I'll, uh, I'll wrap up there. Thank you uh, okay. so much for taking the time out. Yeah, uh, that was farm, fun. Farm time, farm time. So back to the farm, or I'm going to get in the car and drive home. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. So if anyone wants to keep up to date with what you're doing, although from what I understand, you're a bit of an undercover guy. You kind of lay low. You're not big on social media. From what no, I mean I will go through a period of two or three days where I have fun tweeting, but it, it all social media is fire and forget for me because I don't really want to I just want to post something and then not engage with it so I'll post something and then not look at it anymore uh but yeah you, you could follow me on Twitter is that what people are subscribed to me on Twitter but don't expect a lot of tweets uh and that's it that's all my things uh that I do uh I think I'm on Facebook maybe but I think that's just uh my family uh and that's it what else what else would there be oh Instagram I'm not on Instagram. Uh, nope, well, I don't do anything. Well, that's I, I, good. I actually think uh, people that aren't on social media tend to have a, a clearer mind on things, or the value system tends to be different usually because they're spending their time doing other things as opposed to. Yeah, I getting, don't want to make it sound like I'm on social like, media. Yeah, I, I I'm talking. I'm talking, like and I'm, I do this. So okay, I don't. I don't. I'm not using my time. I'm not. Uh, you know, working in a soup kitchen or anything with my social media time. I'm playing Slay the Spire, probably. But uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not, I don't want to make it sound like I'm better than anybody who's on social media. It's just not as, um, I don't get a ton of satisfaction out of it. Mm. Well, thanks. Thanks for your time. Thanks for everything you've done in terms of your writing. I hope maybe you get to a point where you're not stressed when you're, when you're working. But maybe oh, I you like the stress. I don't know. Some people I, do. No, I, I don't like the stress, but it seems to be a part of the. Um, that just comes with the territory. Yeah, it's just what it what happens. It's fine. Uh, I'm, I'm used to it at this point. Um, but yeah, we gotta uh, start Portal Three. That's my message to. Um, let's make it I happen to whoever. If you anything you can do, let's do it. Let's just make Dave, it. Dave, if it you're happen. listening, because. <laughs> uh, yeah, I am. I am also not getting any younger. Like we are, we are reaching the point where it's literally, it's crazy to think. Literally, going to be too old to work on Portal uh, Three. So we should just do it. And desk job is fun. If you like desk job, send mail to Gabe. Yeah, tell him you want some Portal Three. Uh, yeah. It won't do anything, but maybe it'll make you feel. You better. never know. Well, yeah, if you get spammed with emails, then yeah, it'll, then it'll, it'll, <laughs> that's just gonna make him mad at me. Uh, but uh, maybe it'll be worth it. I don't know. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. Well, that's the show, everyone. Make sure you share, like, and subscribe. Uh, start the petition for Portal 3. <laughs> and uh, until next time, stay safe. See you later. Yeah.